Sure. We got interested in the service sector um, because there's a lot of worry that the growth in the service sector is you know, driven by growth and mixed jobs. And so what you see is the service sector growing at the same time that inequality is rising. Uh, but when we started delving more, uh, more deeply into the data, we realized that the growth in services is entirely driven by growth in high skill services, skill intensive services, things like medicine, education, finance, business services. And in fact, the low skill services are all declining, things like transportation, um, even retail is declining. Um, the one exception is, um, is McJobs, is you know, eating places. Um, but, but it's small compared to you know, things like business services, legal services, health services, hospitals, all of these high skill services. Yeah, so what, what, uh, what happens in terms of the, um, the growth in the services is that at, some, uh, at a, basically a middle level of income, the United States hit it about 1950. Um, demand for high skill services starts growing, so demand for these services, and that drives uh, an increase in the demand for skill, and that actually drives an increase in relative wages. So inequality is growing uh, in, in, in part because the demand for high skilled labor is growing, and part of the demand for high skilled labor comes from uh, growing demand for these high skill services. Um, Boer and I wrote, wrote a paper, and we showed this for the United States, uh, we have a paper now uh, with Boer and Rogerson where we've shown that this is a common trend throughout um, the developed countries. And so again, it's, it's very, very similar patterns at uh, when you reach an income of about nine or $10,000 uh, per person. After that, the growth in the service sector accelerates. It's driven by these uh, high skill services. It cor corresponds with growth in college attainment at the same time. So, uh, so largely the research we've done has been focusing on the advanced economies because that's where the data is the best, and that's where you see the, the phenomenon uh, the, the most, you know, the, the strongest. Um, but a, a new project that we have uh, with Abuera and Mestieri, what we're trying to do is construct a, um, a diagnostic tool where we fit um, the typical growth patterns and then developing countries can compare the feed in the data. It's basically just a toolbox that we have in mind and see where uh, potential distortions lie. And um, the toolbox would you know, tell you whether the distortions come from trade, whether they come from um, education policies, uh, whether they come from distortions to the relative prices of sectors, potentially you know, entry, et cetera. Right now, uh, we don't have any you know, clear policy advice to give, but this tool is promising on that front. I think the biggest policy advice I would give to both the rich and the poor countries is that you should, you know, because it's been such a salient pattern among the rich countries and even rapidly growing countries like uh, South Korea that started out poor, um, as the poor countries grow, they should anticipate this happening, the service sector growing and these high skill services uh, growing. The high skill services tend to grow for two reasons. One is that as you get richer, you demand more of these services. The second is that these services tend to have slower productivity growth, so you need more workers in those sectors. Um, lastly, you know, I, I mentioned that it's not, a, it's not a sign of an, inef an inefficient economy, but as a policy thing, you might still be worried about inequality. And in fact, in the United States and Western Europe, uh, rising inequality is a big issue. I think the, the policy message uh, on that is that um, you know, we've seen this pattern for the past uh, 50 years in the United States and in, in other countries. You should expect this pattern to continue. And so for at least this driving force of inequality, it's something that if you find it problematic, you're going to have to uh, think about policies, you know, investing in education, et cetera, to reduce inequality. I don't think it's a, you know, for some, um, for some countries like India, I do some work in Armenia uh, where their borders are, you know, they have a, share a small border with Iran and Georgia. That's not great for trading goods. So some, in some places, uh, they have a comparative advantage in services, and that makes sense. But for most economies and for most services, most services are largely non-tradable. You know, finance and business services are more tradable. Things like healthcare and education are a lot less tradable. So the, you know, the, 
structural change patterns within the country when it comes to services are largely driven by demand patterns. And we see that, in fact, consumption patterns mirror uh, labor patterns and value-added patterns. So I would say it wouldn't be a wise thing to do because in middle income, you don't want that many, you know, when you're at a middle income, you want to spend more money on manufacturing and less money on services. So it would seem like an unwise policy.